pwede. <laughs> Mana ho kele ni ki papahana. Um we ko ma ko mahalo. Ah uh, ko hale wai hona puke. Ah uh, no la ko kela kuliana. Ah uh, ko ka ko o ta ho na awa i ana o ka ka ko ko e. Ah uh, mana le la mahalo mahalo no. Ah uh, kela pu ah uh, we ko ma ko uh, mahalo i ke ya uh, o kipa. Ah uh, ye no ne ke la do ka ko ake a ni ko ka ko ike o ye me a ke pa pa no ko o na wa o ye ani o le la a he le mai la o ya mai ke kula nui o messi ya ma ko mo ko nui o au te a roa a na ti ga ka o mu ka o le lo a o le la a o ye me a dui ko ma halo a ya ne ya ko ya ko peka Hello, <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, mahalo, everybody, for coming. Everybody on Zoom. Um, we're very happy to have Huya Yanki here. She's a professor um, from Massey University who got a Fulbright scholarship to Hawaii um, to work on some projects here. And she is involved in teacher education in um, Maori immersion um, down there. And we have actually uh, worked with Huya over the years on different research projects. Um, through a number of colleagues, and we're very happy to be here here on Maui, and it's your first time on Maui. So, hello, Hania, or Hania. 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 Oh, one more. Oh. First time you get to meet me. I'll take a quick minute to a tie to me here. We'll take a quick minute Nga moana nga motu o Hawaii nei. Um, <coughs> Ingari o nga motu o te motu o uh, Maui tēnā ko. Uh, nga maunga o Maui tēnā kōrua. Um, <coughs> Kia tātou katoa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, he ronga tātou katoa. Kia koe kalei, ngā mihi nei kia koe, ngā tōhu rangatira, ngā hele, ngā mihi kia kōrua, ngā tō karanga kia hau. Um, I te haere ki tēnei rohe, uh, te rohe he motu a tātua. Um, <coughs> He tunu hari tau ngako, ki te kite koutou, ingari te pai huki i te tūtahi e te tahi atu koutou katoa. Ingari te nga koutou, te nga koutou, te aronga tātou katoa. Okay. 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 Um, for what, uh, no um, actually, I'm only giving you part of my papa, uh, but that's where I grew up. I grew up under my manga, uh, alongside the awa, 
and we live at the back of the marae of uh, Hangaria. That's where my ancestors have lain in the past, and it's where I am going to lie when my time comes. And it's a good thing to know where you're going to go. Um, and when you reach a certain age, as you, as you climb that that age um, journey, it becomes even more important mm -hmm. uh, to know where that where, where you have to lie. Because your children have to know what your plans are as well. Um, <clears throat> so I hail from Paki Paki, which is, um, you know, uh, we live on Te Kao Maui. With our stories, you probably know the same story, Maui, Aotearoa. So I live on Te Kao Maui in Te Mata Maui in the Hawke's Bay. Um, but I'm also from Te Waka a Maui. And I keep saying I have a grandmother from the north, a grandmother from the south, a grandmother from the west, and a grandmother from the east. So I've got the whole of the motu or Aotearoa covered, I like to think. <clears throat> um, it's important, I think, you know, I've, I've not done this very much in the past. Um, and that's to talk a lot about myself. In the academic papers, I tend to uh, just get on with it. I think we were talking about it earlier, Kahere and I. But this time, I decided that, that I needed to, um, or as an Indigenous people, position myself as an Indigenous woman, as a Māori woman, as a Ngāti Kahanuni woman, as a woman from um, <clears throat> a family of strong women, uh, to share that part of who I am, who have influenced me into the educator that I've become. Um, so I was born in the in the um, I grew up in the tribal context, as I said, I was very fortunate, actually, that I had a privileged upbringing and a privileged upbringing in that I grew up in a community where I was related to everybody, mm. where I had elders who really spoke English, they only spoke Māori around us, but who only spoke to us in English. Um, and central in our village was our marae, who I've introduced you to, but also two churches. So it was a, it was um, you know the impact of Christian and missionaries, and we were part of that as well. But our churches were um, central. We had both Catholic and Church of England, which is my my family are a, a mixture of churches. Some are Mormon, some are Church of England, some are Catholic. Um, <clears throat> whatever our faith, the important factor for us was our whakapapa, that we were related to one another. And um, and that part of our, our identity was really important. So I've got my dad. My, my dad passed away in, in 2004. He was a, um, a gentle man, a gentle uh, a beautiful gentleman, as are the men in our family. It's the it's the feisty women in our family that calls the shots, but it is the men that keep us grounded, and 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 on an even keel. So that's my mother who passed away um, in two thousand and fifteen, and she was kind of like the matriarch and the central focus of our family, um, and. Uh, Brought up my daughter with, that my husband Bob and I only have the one child who insists on living in Italy, much to my sadness. But you know, that's her life and she's living it. Um, but she grew up with my mother. Um, and so there are special things about children who are who are taught at the feet of their grandparents. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's very special. My my brother was had the same experience. So Fanga is not is not something that's um, uncommon. But my dad, those of you who know Magi Marker, my dad was in the Royal Air Force with Magi's father. They they fought on missions 
um, in, the Air, in the British Air Force. It wasn't, it was very difficult to get into the Air Force, particularly for brown men. And, um, and they uh, were pilots. And my father retrained as a navigator when it looked like they were going to send the New Zealanders back to the Pacific when the Pacific War broke out. <clears throat> and he would be, he died before um, I had completed my PhD. He died the year I was completing. And um, I know that he would be very proud of, of me. <clears throat> proud because education in my growing up time was really, really important to, to, to um, my parents, my grandparents, and, and uh, the generations before us. Although my own education was in a Pākehā context, a Hauli context, in that we might have lived in, uh, in, in Pakikaki, my parents built a house in Hastings, so, <clears throat> so, um, which was only 15, 20 minutes away. So I had this kind of split upbringing in town for the week to go to school. That was my school, this one here, Rorika. And then um, back out to Pakifak on the weekends. We picked up on a Friday. But my parents, both of them, and their parents and their siblings, uh, um, they went to my, my father and my brothers, and I've got, only got two, but my brothers and dad's brothers and dad's dad and grandfather went to Teoti College and my mother went to the girls school not that they they were at different times mum was at, at high school during during um during the war but the important thing about <clears throat> both Teoti and Hukurere and the, these they were among the first of the modern boarding schools is that they were built as elite schools for um Māori uh the, the the sons and the daughters of Māori um, leaders. I'm not going to say chiefs, because everybody wants to be a chief, but I'll say leaders in the community. Um, and Te uh, uh, and the Hukurea Brother Sister School, one is in the central Hawke's Bay in the country, um, and then Hukurea uh, was on the hill of Napier Hill. I've got two old pictures because those photographs are as they were when my parents went to those schools. And <clears throat> what the, the education that those, um, that my dad and my mother got was for my father preparation for him to get to for Māori boys to become farmers and for the girls preparation to be the wives, good wives of Māori farmers. And that was the, uh, <clears throat> In both those schools, the um, curriculum <coughs> was uh, centered on on the on that on social engineering. Um, originally, Teotihuacan was based on the English private schools, um, Eton and rugby, those schools, um, and in fact, it has a lot of graduates. Who became um, quite famous in books in in the in Aotearoa, uh, in terms of leadership? It's quite a few knights of the realm that come out of that school. Um, and then Rorika School that I went to is a there were only four other families, Māori families, um, and <clears throat> um, you know I read when I was. Um, my early days at university, I read these terrible stories about Māori who, and their experiences at, at school. I loved school. And the reason I loved school was because I could read, I could write, I was tall, and I, could, I was articulate as a child. Well, the, local, the, the, the aunties and the nannies thought I was too much of a chatterbox. And that, <laughs> I was always getting flipped around for that. I understand that in Hawaii, um, you know, what school you got, you went or you go to or you went to is important in terms of identity. Um, not so much for us back home, actually. Yeah. However, 
whilst I grew up in a community that spoke Māori, my generation are the lost their generation. We were encouraged. And part of that has to do with the way in which um, a Western ideals and you know that you know that story. So I'm not going to bother to repeat it, but it is something that it, it ends up to being a, a kind of thing that Bell Hooks talks about as as being self hatred. And I can recall my grandmother saying, "Do not talk like that. You sound like the Park kids." Mm -hmm. Now she was a beautiful Maori speaker. I'm told she died when I was quite young. But she was also a beautiful English speaker. She'd gone to this private school, Hukurere, where the teachers were English women. So they were taught to speak nicely, to you know, know your manners, how to eat with a knife and fork, how to set a table with, you know, lots of knives and forks going in either direction. <laughs> and they kept to that. We had these formal little tea parties at our house. Margie, we, we share stories, and she has a similar upbringing. <laughs> Um, so, you know, there was, there is a loss that, uh, was not seen by our parents and, and elders at the time. The other thing about education in our family is that I was the first to leave home and become a teacher. I'm the first in the whānau. I was the first to graduate out of the university with anything. I was the first with a doctorate. And in my extended family, there are 47 teachers at my last, at the last count. Mm -hmm. There are three doctorates. There's two of us in there. I don't know. I just realized when I, before that, this is not the picture that I meant. But there's one, there's another one missing and she's <laughs> off on the side. But <clears throat> that was, um, we were celebrating when uh, my niece sitting in the front there uh, got her doctorate and we were celebrating that as a family. I mean, Jessica, it's my first cousin's daughter. Um, she's principal of our local school that my father went to and his brothers and her father and grandfather. So, you know, there's been this intergenerational um, uptake of education being, you know, central. Um, it's not that for all members of my family, I might add. I've got some sad stories as well. Um, in our family. Um, oops, wrong way. <clears throat> so I trained as a primary teacher many years ago and have been now involved in education for 30 plus, 30, 40 years. And <clears throat> I came to Massey um, in 1991 when the then head of Māori studies at Massey, his name is um, Mason Jury, you might, might have heard of him. Um, he's very well known back in our back home. Um, he offered my husband a job, Bob is in the visual arts area, and um, he uh, uh, tunneled to Bob to come and help set up an art program. That was in 1991. And one of the things that I learned from Mason um, because he's an extraordinary leader, extraordinary man. And what I learned from him was the importance of mentoring those who you can see who have got potential. He knew that I'd been a teacher. He knew that I had a certain amount of skills because I'd been in the game for about 15 years by then. And so he offered me a job as an a, a, a teaching as an academic and um, introducing this like Māori, Māori Culture 101, that, that paper. And I had to think about that um, because he'd also given me a job before that. When I first arrived, the second day I've arrived, uh, we arrived at, at campus. He asked me if I'd run this student support program and then offered me this position as a Māori learning support consultant. I was the very first one at Massey to, to become a Māori support consultant. I don't know what the hell it was. And uh, well, I learned pretty quickly. And But when he offered me a, a position as an academic, I asked this, my, this, myself the question, if I choose to work in this institution, what does that mean for the people I serve? 
What does that mean for my, my people back home? How do I make what I am about to get involved in count? And, um, and how do I make what I do accessible? How do I make this, this uh, institution accessible? So those were, that, that was a question I asked myself before I accepted the job as, um, um, as a primary school teacher. As, as a lecturer, sorry. But my, my career as a teacher, I taught in South Auckland. And if you know Aotearoa, South Auckland is where um, <clears throat> the government undertook social engineering in the 1960s and built uh, um, areas where the majority of people who lived there were Māori and Pacific Islanders. And um, they were trying to pepper pop called the pepper potting social engineering system. What they tried to do was to pepper pot um, Māori and non-Māori and Pacific Islanders. And um, I taught there the predominantly Pacific Island uh, uh, children. And in my training as a teacher, I came under that the, the um, philosophy that we teachers are the font of all knowledge and that children are our empty receptacles into which we have to pour the knowledge. And can you think about the ridiculous that is? I believed it. That's what I thought. Um, and, um, and it wasn't until I started teaching in South Auckland as a very young teacher, I was, you know, so just got into my 20s. And I started teaching children who I realized they, most of them had come from the island. And it, uh, over time, and, and well, actually it was very quickly as well, I learned that I was in classrooms of children that had more knowledge than me about life. They could do things that I couldn't do. And that was a kind of a um, conscientization, if you like over the space of about two or three years and realized that, hell, I know by the law. Um, I haven't been prepared for classrooms where uh, the children have um, all this cultural knowledge because they could speak to each other in their Nguyen, Samoan, uh, Tupelan, um, Cook Island, not the Māori kids though. Um, they could speak to each other. And uh, that, that, that had a huge impact, again, on my, um, on my philosophy of teaching. Uh, I was a monoglot, they were not. And um, so that philosophy that those children, all eight, nine years old of them, um, taught me has underpinned my career and set me up for the things that I've been able to achieve with brilliant team of people over the last 10, 15 years. And I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, <clears throat> oh, and I missed out the important thing. So, so <clears throat> um, you know probably Graham's work. Three of you do, <laughs> and others. Um, <clears throat> and Graham now works. We're so fortunate to have him working with us at Monty, and I used to work with him almost every every day. But he has said something back in 2013 that is such an important, again, a kind of important idea about. Um, our community. So I'm just now moving into um, this idea that unless you, if you want so, if you want your communities to improve, if you want sustainable economic development, then you, there has to be a, a revolution. The revolution is that which is in education, and that we need to, in that revolution, we need to be building our own models of what we can put in place. Transforming. 
um, and which also link with the, uh, the aspirations of our, our, our communities. <clears throat> so um, I want to I want to begin there because um, it moves into I think the the title of my of my talk is actually over here <laughs> because the kind of work that we're involved with as Indigenous people is always about what we call back home mana mutahake, um, self-determining, self-governing, um, or tingoranga tirotanga. Um, oops, sorry, wrong way. So the first, uh, the first instance of this uh, work occurred when uh, we came to Massey and Bob set up Toyo Kiabati. It is still remains the only Māori visual arts program in the country, um, but it's over 25 years old now. So we can now look back and see, have, have we done what we set out to do? And I, I put the collective we in because um, I've taught some of the students in the courses I teach. Um, Bob is from Ngāti That's his house. He has re refurbished and restored it, belonged to his great 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 grandfather, who was a well known carver of the day. So he's carrying on the tradition uh, in his community that are handed down from his ancestors. Um, he tells a story about painting the house blue and how that was not in line with what the elders felt it ought to be. It ought to be read like everybody else's. But of course, that's, that is a Western construct. Mm. It's an artificial construct. Houses were not necessarily red or blue. But Hamilton, the first director of the Auckland, of, of the New Zealand Museum um, Institute, put out a book that said, this is how, what Māori art looks like. This is how it feels. So this is what it is. And it's taken a generation to school ourselves out of the idea that what, how we were constructed was a misconstruct and a misinformation. And certainly has been part of whole and epistemology of ignorance on either side. So Bob takes his students up to Waikato Bay, which is um, uh, two hours north of, of Gisborne, out in the Wops, but overlooking the sea. And they have. In fact, they were supposed to go last couple of weeks ago, but we've had these terrible storms, can't get there anymore because of the roads. So they're looking at going hopefully next year. So the first program was Toyo Kiapati. The importance of that program was, um, I'm going to use Kopapa Māori because for us, that's a term which uh, is, is about a theory of change. We've all got our own, own uh, terms, but that's the term. It's a term that was, is associated with the development of Māori schooling called Kurakopa for Māori. And <clears throat> um, Graham and Linda, when they were sharing a position at Auckland University, uh, developed this with their team of people who are themselves, the only Kihema, Bagi Gohepa, who are now themselves um, leaders in education and other things, um, have uh, worked up over the, over the intervening years, over 35 years, I think it was now. Um, so, and <clears throat> it comes out of the revolution of Kohanga mm -hmm. I know that Hawaii were the first next off the block mm -hmm. after after us to establish Kohanga Reo and then Kura Kaupapa um, <clears throat> So the importance of, of uh, Kaupapa Māori development is in the self-determining that whole idea of self-determination. And so with this program, that was one of them. But we had to use strategies and tactics in order to make a Māori program that is a fine arts program, essentially, um, acceptable to an institution mm -hmm. that doesn't see Māori art, culture, language at the time as important. 
And so it was really in the writing of how we wrote, of how Bob and Nathan wrote the proposal for the program. And that both of them are pretty clever people at writing technical language that is acceptable. So that what the university thought they were getting is not actually what they got. They thought they were getting carving and weaving. And Bob is not a carver and he's not a weaver. But that's a specialist position. Special Mātauranga Māori is involved, and that's better left in Awanui Ārangi or the Wānanga. Certainly wasn't the place he thought for it in, in, in an institution like this. And um, <clears throat> what they got was an art programme. So you did talk, you write it in terms of 3D, 2D. So 3D, they think, you know, carving, actual fact was sculpture. And right. using those language, but it was very useful because that that was a very good model to develop what I was going to be doing unbeknownst to me some 10, 15 years later. Um, so, you know, when you look back at did what we set out to do, what has been the impact over time? And um, I've just picked those, these Wahine because I love them. I've taught them, but it's that's not my um, teaching. It's the work that they got in in that program that have led them to become uh, the Walters Prize, which is our our top prize in Aotearoa for art. And they're highly sought after. They're off to this Biennale, the Sydney Biennale, it was, and they're off to uh, Thailand. Um, and their work is in high demand. We're lucky that we've still got Teddy, who's uh, the one on the right, on this side. Um, but they're all beautiful women who do beautiful art. And uh, but they're just one example. I could have got we could spend a whole time, a whole whole hour on on, on their on their work. So then, um, since two thousand and nine. Um, I led the development of these immersions. Um, and you are asking yourself, how does someone who is from the lost generation of language end up leading uh, an immersion program or two immersion programs? Uh, the woman in the middle was the Minister of Education at the time. Tony Wahoo on the right was helped me to develop this. And we've since lost Tony. I think you might know his son. The son lives here in Hawaii. Um, and I brought her to let her know what we were doing, hoping she'd give us some resources. Um, but the whole, <clears throat> so I, when I inherited um, the immersion program, the university wanted to shut them down because it had its idea of what constitutes a, 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 a quality initial teachers or teacher training program. And it wasn't. Or could have come up on mine and then think that that was a good idea. So we have, and you know, we still continue to have a, a teacher supply issue. Um, and one of the things that I had heard over the years is principals of Kurukopa are saying, oh, yeah, when they find out I'm at the teacher's college and I'm training teachers, they'd say to me, oh, yeah, you're a lot of hopeless. We have to retrain all the teachers we get from you guys. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, well, that's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And when I got Te Awatataring, for example, um, I, I, I just happened to have it to be there at the right time. Um, I decided I had, I was, the, I was the head of school. That's how I managed and I, this program under, under, my, uh, under my responsibility. I had no teachers who had taught in a kūrakaupa for Māori. Mm -hmm. I had um, no, so they'd not taught, they hadn't trained in the kura or they were too old, we didn't have that kind of training and there wasn't any training in a university at that time. So I spoke to Tony and he and his team in the Runanga Nui o Ngā Kura Kaupapa Māori, which is the overarching organisation back home who have oversight of the Kura Kaupapa Māori system. And he agreed to come in with me and to help me to co-construct and develop 
a new training program. The important thing for them, for the Uru Nanui was, and that's their community, they represent the community, was that the students had to be Te Ahumatua trained. That was an important thing about any kurakaupa for Māori, you have to subscribe to the philosophy of Te Ahumatua. Um, you, can, you can see it online. You might be able to translate it. Um, into, you might be able to, sorry, not translate. You might be able to read it in the real. You'll be able to, from the Hawaiian, you'll go, yes, how to read it in the real. And um, so we set up a partnership. So <clears throat> to this day, we have a partnership, the university um, has a part, we have a partnership with the Runanga Nui. We've co constructed two programs and we, they teach in the program as well. And that way, the program is then authentic. And, um, you know, I, we knew what we want. The community was telling me, this is what we want, and you got to try and make it happen. Now, um, and the idea always that our community would be flourishing to the old Māori speaking communities. Um, rather than at the individual level. These are three of our graduates. These are the pukinga, these are our experts, um, and the team that I work with, that I love every one of them. Um, Kathy Jews, you may have heard, she was one of the architects of the Kurakapa Kamali system, had been there right from the outset, set up a kohanga. <laughs> she still has her own school uh, kura and Brenda, Lawari, they're all principals of Kurukoka for Māori still in Aotearoa. The, those are all the ones along the front, uh, along the top, the four, five on the top are out of uh, the Runanga Nui, and they teach in the program. And then the team, my team down the bottom are all based in the university. But the important thing is that by the taught in the Kurukoka, they have been a principal of a Kurukoka, or they have now, and we've got our first one, Hona. He's our first Raukura, and he's a senior lecturer, and I've known him since he was a baby. So ready to ha hand the uh, reins over to that generation. Yeah. Um, so the principles of transforming is this partnership between Tukutaya, Tuya School, and the Runanga Nui. And those are the, are the principles. So over time, we have this partnership. You've got to work really hard. My job, so uh, what I showed you were the Pukinga who teach in the program. My job as a non-teacher in the program is to engage with the university, to speak the university speak, to write the stuff uh, that you do have to in university speak. Um, but fortunately, we can also do it in Te Reo. So they do, they, I take care of all of that. And the reason for that is because they, um, they uh, you can't teach in the kura kaupapa, you can't teach in the program, it's just too difficult. And then engage with the university. It's just too difficult. You know, people fall over quickly. So um, we, so, so those are the principles. Um, we have a border studies. The border studies I set up because I wanted to protect the pro program from the university. So I got, you know, Kimoti Kare to all of all the guns uh, who, who are the community leaders in Kareo. Um, and you know, one of the important things about tra transforming and um, doing this from the inside of an institution like a university, for example, is the important, importance of naming in, a, in, in opposition to, to, to policy. Our university has a policy that no centres will be established. And if you do establish a centre, it's a huge process. I just simply gave us a name, Toikura. Oh, we'll be a centre. So um, we just did that. And, you know, you say it often enough, then our truth becomes a university reality. So everybody talks about Torikura, and that's the Parker version of it. Anyway, what we have set up is, um, you know, we've got the post the postgraduate, and that really is about so the doctoral programs, the um, the 
masters. It's all about developing leaders with skill sets. That's really what it's about um, and the types of research. But again, the big focus for us over the years has been that our Fano would be Māori speaking Fano, well that was taken for granted, but that um, um, you know that our long term goals are, are linked with uh, the aspirations of our community. Uh, that it would be a um, uh, a education for Māori by Māori with Māori that our graduates would be would live healthy lifestyles, um, would be upwardly mobile economically, um, would participate in the fully in society, confident in both Māori te ao Māori and te ao Pākehā. And we have evidence to suggest after 30, 40 years that graduates of Kura Kaupapa Māori are more likely to live healthy lifestyle are more likely to go on to higher education and um, are more likely to be have futures that are economically secure. Um, Linda and Graham put this under this notion of indigenous work. Uh, they wrote a really excellent article in uh, the Handbook of Indigenous Education that Linda edited. And <clears throat> what they do is to, to bring together a summary, a synthesis, and an analysis of Indigenous work across the world uh, from all of their experiences working at both the high level and um, deep in their communities. So, you know, just very quickly, what is Indigenous work? Well, inherently, it's political. Anybody in this room is probably involved in this. Um, but it is setting up agendas and strategies and tactics and policies and um, building relationships and so forth and so on. And, you know, with this, no doubt this all, all resonates with, with you. Um, but for us in the university, it's about changing the status quo, which is an ongoing challenge. Um, but the key shift, and it's one that we've tried to adhere to, is to be pro, um, proactive rather than reactive. So we're always trying to be one ahead, one ahead, one ahead. It, it, the reality is we're doing both, um, and more the reactive <laughs> proactive. Um, but the other two important aspects are the, are the last two um, bullet points, and that's drawing on our knowledges. Now, what we've done, one, one of the things that is really concerning is the way in which our terms, our language have been appropriated by our institutions. And so they're giving back our terms. Now, unfortunately, it's our own people that are helping them. So what that suggests is that uh, we've got to do more work on, um, you know, developing our own people to ensure that they understand what it means when we do things like this. Um, there's this short sort of focus of our institution that wants to be treated there that says that puts Tadell available to everybody, but, but the systemic changes needed are still there. Um, those things that prevent us from um, getting access. So the other part of our work has been AERA, that's our last one we went to, we've got another one coming up in um, April. Um, and everyone there has been doing this work. Um, I want to acknowledge Mahi Mata, because Mahi, uh, way back in 2000, at the New Orleans uh, AERA, we sat <clears throat> the foot of her mum's bed, and she filled out the this copious forms and um, Linda and Graham submitted and set up the Indigenous Peoples of the Pacific. We did the right thing though. We did uh, uh, ask permission of the Indigenous Peoples of the Americas because we were over on the Amer in America and it was important that we asked their permission. 
and we had had a really good relationship and had a free conference prior to AERA. But the importance of AERA is it brings together Indigenous peoples from all over the world, but it also it's a, it's a place where um, we have to, you know, we can share, but it's also a place where we've got to be on our guard because there is an increasing number of non-Indigenous people claiming Indigenous knowledge. And I can give you an example that's hot off the press, and I'm going to tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. It's the Handbook of Research on Teachers of Colour and Indigenous Teachers. Now, the problem with that book is that there are no authors, that none of the editors are Indigenous. There is only one article in that handbook written by an Indigenous person who we know. And they have recently uh, applied to be um, a special interest group, a SIGS of AERA. Now, <laughs> one of our, um, Margie and our, our group, one of our strategies was to ensure that one of us was in either the um, executive of AERA or on council. Margie had been on both. Linda's currently on council and I'm currently on the exec. I come off in April. Um, Linda's still got another couple of years to go. That we receive as a, as a member of that um, special interest executive group, we receive applications for six. So I had a board providing the justification why this should not be given permission to set up a six at AERA. So um, for now, it isn't. But um, and Linda's is, is in the, because then it goes up the food chain to the, to the council and, and they are um, rubber stamp. We just, we just give um, a recommendation. Um, so even when you get on these committees, you've got to make them count. There's not that much point sitting there as a bystander or in silence. You have to be prepared to um, speak out. And it was not easy because there were a lot of people that supported it. But after I gave a very good cordial that went on for about 15 minutes, I think they gave up, they were sick of hearing me talk. But anyway. Um, and then, you know, you need your intellectual leaders. And I'm not talking about academic leaders, but academic. Academic, anyone can be an academic, just need a job in the university for it. But not everybody is an intellectual. And um, I asked permission for you to be <laughs> Kelly Cook, because I think you are. Um, and <clears throat> because it's an intellectual endeavor that helps us think our way through. Um, not all of us are able to see what our intellectual leaders can see. Um, and of course, our job is also to ensure that we have a succession plan and that we're mentoring the next generation. So at this conference at Massey, that um, in 2019, that team came to, Summer was able to share her research as a keynote, but all the other, other speakers were in workshops that they were all, um, uh, and, and that, that was an excellent way for students and old head all to have some internationalization experience. Um, and of course, <laughs> us three have been around a long time. Um, and I want to end with this one. And the reason I want to end with this is because a picture doesn't tell what's really going on with you. Um, this was the launch of Tepeke. It's a massive, um, it was actually made some of uh, um, Graham's idea to have a, um, a support system in the institution for those doing their doctorate based on the MIND program. And I said to him, oh, that's a great idea. Well, we've got NASA next week. How about we, we invite all of those indigenous people who are there? And I've got Margie's up there, come down and well, let's have a launch. Oh, okay. So off we did. We, we got everybody there. And you can see there's people here. 
that you know is sitting there, and we received the hui from um, the Hawaii contingent, and it was a fabulous day. But in behind the scenes, Graham, who was our Deputy Vice Chancellor of Māori, was getting slammed. The university were not happy. Who do you brown folk think you are to launch this thing? Because we had the cameras there, it was in the newspapers, but we hadn't asked permission. And that did not make sense to us because Graham was the PVC, the DVC Māori. All other DVCs in the university make decisions. They don't have to get permission. But it really got, um, and it reverberated for quite some time afterwards. We had a great time, but it reverberated. So that was in 2019. Um, and it took us to meeting to calm the administrators down and let them know that no, the Māoris are not going to take over the university or the graduate research school. We're only interested in our own. We're not in, in, interested in, in you know, um, all the rest of the hundreds of doctoral students are in the university. Um, and I, I look at that day and think, oh my God, so pleased that people didn't really know that poor old Graham was, uh, he had to go to a meeting in the middle of it to front up. Um, and uh, I know that's a bit of a negative end, but the good thing <laughs> is, is that the university really loved to pick our toy. They, they send us resources, they keep away, they allow us the time, they engage with us because we had to ensure that we had those relationships with those who, you know, got the money and um, support our students. So it did have a happy ending that it's taken, it took, it, took a, it took a year. So I'm gonna leave it there. I was only gonna talk for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I did warn that, I warned that I'm a teacher. <laughs> I'll write notes. But um, look, I'll leave it there because there may be some questions and, um, Oh, make it easy, please. <laughs> oh, I, I guess just curious. I mean, you know, being at a conference, uh, I mean, I'm not saying attention, you could see there was that those kind of issues around the ground, I guess. Uh, the direction really of, I, mean, I, I guess it's always the tension of you know, more of a transformation of revolutionary change in the system or one that's more just really adapting or some kind of uh, reformation, I guess, part of. You know, the politics, especially the admin level. I'm just curious what you see as going to be the future, kind of like what are future struggles as someone that's been admin for a while. Like, what do you see the, the future struggles in regards to Maori education? Yeah. I mean, that's such a good question. And you know, the, the, the frustration is coming from our own, actually. Um, because at the end of the day, the leadership, the administrative leadership, they want compliant brown people. They don't want the likes of me or Graham, or and Graham was sidelined fairly quickly, fairly early in the piece. Um, yeah, it's because compliance is much more important because, um, you know, even if a university and the university is in is three now, they are claiming to be treaty led, to treaty led, you know, we have a treaty, um, the Treaty of Waitangi. And, but, what people don't understand is that it's, uh, it's treaty led uh, on paper only. It's rhetoric. And the emphasis is on providing everybody with the ability to learn to their Māori. So they've provided free lessons for any staff member in the university who wants to learn. Uh, it's all very well. But the, there's still um, the systemic barriers, um, institutional. Uh, or here's an example: I've been fighting now for two years to be to have an acad Maori academic representation on council. Uh, we only have one representative from uh, academic representative on council who's a non-Maori person. 
and the, you know, um, the argument was, well, I speak for everybody, Julia. No, not for me, you don't. You don't see what I see. You can't see what we see. You can't speak on behalf. Those days are supposed to have gone. And it's taken two years for them to come around to the idea because it does mean a change in legislation to have a Māori representation or put a Māori on there, but they have a voting system and you know you can't get any of us to go and to be voted on because everyone is running away from responsibility. Mm -hmm. but, um, well, I mean, that's a good question. Okay. I kind of see when, when we've done that, we're, you know, in Hawaii, I'm probably familiar with Māori idea of how the University of Hawaii has been trying to crop ideologies of resistance against against so-called colonization. So something like Aloha'aina, which is a very yeah. you know, I mean, very strong ideological philosophical basis mm -hmm. of the Hawaiian self-determination or we're pushing back against the so-called manifest system of the university. Mm -hmm. But the university then therefore then takes you know, that's a so called ideology, and you find ways to adopt it to yeah. say, well, just like the treaties, the same thing. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the treaty university, we're going to yeah, be a yeah. high university now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it becomes, and then of course, you have those Native Hawaiians who, because of their own maybe personal, own personal goals, I guess, for themselves, yeah. who are more willing to accept the university walking yeah. those kind of ideologies for. Personal Game. positionality within the university. Yeah. So I know that, that's kind of what I, what I, I kind of tied in the same kind of question about the treaty. The, the university is going to be you know, based upon the treaty. Mm. And really, the same way, like Alaina is it's really just a bunch of rhetoric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. University. No real change or transformation at no, all. No, no, no. But it makes it appear on the, yes. right? We'll put up Hawaiian language signs now. We'll put up. Yeah, all, yeah, yeah. But in regards to any kind of changes, nothing at all. Well, we, every committee in our institution now has a Māori name. And, you know, it, and it, uh, so it, uh, there's just one that's happened in my absence for the finance department. And since when has the finance department had any sort of engagement with us on any level? You know, what we to, you know, what you try and do is to, is to use it as a platform, you know, to use it, to, to turn it and to use it you know when we did point out this is what a treaty led would mean you know co-governance oh they don't want to go there um and we've i've been down that track written a paper pointed it out met with the vice chancellor and she was very 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 angry but you know if you you just got to keep pushing pushing i mean we have come a long way since i first started there 30 years ago I have to say, we have come a long way, but we haven't come far enough. And we, it, although it's like you take one step forward and three steps back, because I'm seeing now that I'm over here, you know, you look back at your own institution, you can see it more clearly. And I'm seeing things that are happening in Aotearoa that tell me that we're regressing because more institutions are saying we are becoming treaty led. Now, the vice chancellors of each university in New Zealand. They have a committee called the Vice Chancellor's Committee. And obviously, they're all getting together, having their little court at all. Two of now, there's three that have come out and said they're treaty led. Matthew was first, there's another two now. Then, when you have a look at what they're doing to, to um, uh, celebrate being treaty led, very proud. One's looking at changing its name, the other one, we're not quite sure because they haven't quite worked it out yet. And so you, you know, you start thinking it's just more of the same. So it's always going to be these, these are always going to be challenges. The thing about being part of the programs like this one and the one that's Bob is that the way in which we are able to deliver the programs means that you can keep the institution from appropriating some of the work. One of the things that the university is becoming to know is that Mātauranga Māori experts are in the Department of Māori Studies and the School of Māori Studies. They are not 
for anybody to go to any Māori or any brown face and ask. Well, that's what's been happening. Now we've got enough information going up the food chain to say, you want to make some decisions, you come about mate and Māori, but like well, you, what you were talking about before, Kalei. Mate and Māori is, is um, highly contested. Uh, even the gov way the government has uh, using and abusing and appropriating the word. So, you know, I, I, I make the claims that my team are involved in Mātauranga Māori all of the time because they, they don't, in our programs, there's no English in both the undergrad and both, both uh, undergrad and postgraduate. It's um, te reo only. So, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you you just have to keep trying to uh, to strategize and um, bring our people up to par. Actually, uh, Graham and Linda talk about that as part of the project of Indigenous work is knowing the system and how to recognize. The trouble is. What you recognize and you see straight away all those things, it's like, ugh, goes like this. Not everybody can see that. I mean, I can see it. And I'm, you know, <laughs> somebody and they, they, can, they can't see what we can see. So our own people within the institutions. But um, what you were talking about before is what Graham Smith calls the private intellectual, the private academic, privatized academic. That it is that those are those uh, of, uh, of Ma um, those Māori who are um, not criticism, it's just what they are. They're, their preference is to be in the system, to do all of the mahi, to get up the food chain. Um, you know, I think I'd be further ahead if I hadn't done what we've been doing because <laughs> this takes all the energy and got time to go up the food chain, actually. It's just that when, you, when you're in there long enough and you're old enough, people think that Oh, then you must know something. <laughs> anyway, I think, that, I think that's it. I don't know if there's anybody online. I think that nobody's got any more questions? N no questions here, I don't think. Um, Oh, no questions from the chat. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say, I think, um, you know, engaging in indigenous work outside of Hawaii is, um, it, it's easier to kind of present things. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, being able to talk to people about other institutions and other institutions. So sometimes, in your own institution, you can get into the and that's when you put it in the outside. So that it is a really interesting um, Mahalo me a white whale for somebody, and we get to spend another two weeks outside of her. I think we'll get it, but <laughs> I think we'll enjoy it. <laughs> but Mahalo me.